I always knew I wanted to be in the Army. Uh, my father was in uh, the Army. All of my uncles served at one point or another. And uh, for me, it was just something that growing up, I knew that I, I wanted to be in the Army. I never considered the Air Force or the Navy or the Marines or the Coast Guard. For me, I don't know what it was, but I felt like that was the place for me. And when I got there, I felt like I was a round peg in a round hole and I was in the place that I was meant to be. You know, when I first went in, in 2000, and, and I was uh, given the opportunity to say, what are the different jobs out there? You know, you take your ASVAP test, and they show you these are the things that they're giving bonuses for, and, and this is what's going on out there. And I wanted to be, at that time, I was joining the reserves. And uh, I knew that I was moving to Florida. This was directly after high school, so I was joining the reserves, moving to Florida all at the same time. And uh, so I had to say, what units are available down in the area that I'm moving to? Because I was coming to school down here. And they said, well, there's a combat engineer unit in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I was going to be going to school in West Palm Beach, Florida. I said, okay, that's the one that I'll take. The Army will train you at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri to design, emplace, and employ demolitions. So I did my first basic training at Fort Leonard Wood uh, when I became a combat engineer. And then later in my military career, I transitioned to a, a different job field and uh, ultimately became an EOD technician where I went to Eglin Air Force Base, learning to become a bomb technician uh, later in my career. And that's where I spent most of my career. About a year and a half uh, after 9-11 happened, maybe two years after that, my reserve unit got called up. Uh, we, we mobilized for a, a little bit over a year, and then about a year after I came back, I transitioned over to active duty military. I was deployed to Afghanistan in 2010. So I was working out of Kandahar, uh, but where I worked out of uh, Afghanistan, uh, we were basically stationed on, on CAF, and we were there because that's where the air assets were. So I was uh, part of a JSOC asset known as the 28th EOD. It was an EOD team that uh, I was doing all of my support, primarily uh, in support of the 75th Ranger Regiment. So as a bomb technician, and a bomb technician specifically within special operations, it's not the same as when you're part of a conventional bomb tech unit where you have robots and bomb suits and your job is to get rid of every explosive device that's on the battlefield, whatever the battlefield is. That's the, the conventional EOD mission set. My mission set was to make sure that our assault force could get safely from A to B, from wherever we were dropped off by our helicopters to wherever our targeted compound or our high-valued uh, target was, was at to make sure that we got from A to B safely. So if that meant that I said we could walk around this explosive device or I had to get rid of this explosive device or I had to render it safe, whatever I had to do so that we could get to one place safely, we tried to do surreptitious work. We didn't want the enemy to know that we were there or that one of their buddies had been scooped up except for maybe a couple days later they wondered you know, where their buddy went and why they hadn't seen him in a couple days. Um, that was the goal of the mission. So if I had to blow something up, obviously they would know that we were present. I was a bomb technician that always worked under the cover of darkness, uh, always under night vision optics. We didn't turn flashlights on for anything in the most IED-laden country on earth. So it would pucker you up from time to time. I remember the night that I was wounded as vividly as if it were last night. Um, it was, uh, again, just one of those missions where we were headed out into the dark of night to a high-value target. Uh, we were dropped off by a couple of Chinook helicopters. Our assault force was divided in two. We were on two Chinook helicopters. We were dropped off actually into a tall pot field, a tall marijuana field. There's a lot of those in Afghanistan. A lot of pot fields, a lot of pomegranate orchards, a lot of opium. Uh, that night we were in a tall pot field. And I just remember that because I hated walking through them because they're such tall stalks and they're not uh, in rows like corn or you know something else where you can walk up and down a row. Uh, it's a pain to walk through them. That's, that's the point of what I'm getting at. And uh, we were on the wrong side of a river, had to get to the other side to get to where our target was. And as I was leading and clearing the way that night, we came to an area that I determined there was probably some explosive devices buried in the ground and I needed to find them uh, as, as we were crossing this river bank. And I did everything that I could to look for them and find them. I looked for batteries, I looked for wires, looked for disturbed earth in the ground. I looked for trip wires um, because we had a mission in that same area, just a couple missions before that where I'd lost a couple brothers, uh, still wear their name on my wrist. Uh, I'd lost them uh, when they tripped a trip wire outside of a compound when they were assaulting into it. So I was very keen on looking for that. And I didn't find any devices. I didn't see any sign of devices, even though I, something inside me told me that they had to be there. Ultimately, I found one when I stepped on it. In all likelihood, it detonated beneath my feet. 
Um, it tumbled me through the air. I can remember when I landed on my back and I was engulfed in this, this cloud of dust and dirt because I couldn't see anything. It was surrounding me um, because it was, it was buried under however much dirt and it was all blown up into my eyes and I'm trying to wipe all of this stuff out of my eyes and that's when I realized how damaged my left arm was because at that time, all of my fingers were broken and they were, they were pointing in other directions. When I say they were broken, they were badly broken, every single one of them. And my left index finger was still there, but it was barely hanging on and it's not there today, so it was barely hanging on. And there's a lot of damage to my forearm that you can't see with my jacket, but that was all hanging off. And so as I'm trying to clear my eyes, I'm seeing the damage that's done to my arm and I'm realizing that I can't get up and I'm realizing that, you know, trying to catch my breath, the wind was knocked on me from the concussion of that explosion. And uh, eventually my men, they got to me, uh, a couple of medics and a couple of the other guys that were on that assault force. Um, they made their way to me and they started to render aid to me. Probably the most painful thing that I can ever remember uh, is when they had to put tourniquets on me. Um, you know, so they took, I had two tourniquets that were on my kit and one of them had to grab another tourniquet off of their kit and they had to wrench one down on each of my legs and wrench one down onto my, onto my left arm in order to keep me from bleeding out. Uh, so probably the most painful thing that I can remember from that night. And eventually they put me onto a stretcher and they loaded me up and they uh, called in a, a medevac helicopter to a, to a makeshift landing zone. And, uh, they brought me out there, they carried me out there. It was a very surreal experience at that point, being carried on a, on a stretcher across the rough terrain of the earth, the way that four men carry a heavy person laying on the flat of their back, it was very surreal. And uh, they loaded me onto that helicopter and they gave me a salute. And they told me that I'd be okay. And they went on to finish the mission and I went on to uh, start a new normal to life. I was injured September 19th, 2010, that period of darkness uh, serving in Afghanistan. I have no memories for about a week, maybe a couple days longer until I woke up a little bit over a week later in Washington DC in Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Uh, I only remember that moment because whenever it was that I woke up there, uh, I woke up and the nurse said, hey, you know, do you know where you are? And I said, no. They said, you know, listen, you're Brian Mast. Uh, you were injured serving in Afghanistan. You're in Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, DC, and you're gonna be in surgery in a couple hours. I said, okay. Recovery was its own adventure. Uh, and it was its own chapter in and of itself to life. Uh, from the moment that I woke up in that hospital, I had one mission and that was to get out of that hospital as quick as I possibly could. And that came through both drive and naivete. Uh, I was naive about some things. It's almost embarrassing to me at some point when I think back on it. I'm not really embarrassed about it, but I think back on it and think, you know, man, I must have sounded so silly at that time. Um, because part of what drove me immediately in the immediate days that I was injured was, uh, you know, saying, look, I'm going to, uh, you know, do a couple months of physical therapy. I'm going to slap on a pair of prosthetics and I'm going to be out the door on the next rotation to Afghanistan. You know, I, I, I part of me all honestly believed that in my mind. Now there was a lot more to it than that. I ended up having to do physical therapy for the better part of 14 months. And when I did that, it was still my mission. I was the first one in physical therapy every single day and I was the last one out every single day. They had to throw me out of there because I was determined that I was gonna get out of that place as quickly as I could. But part of me also knew that I was never gonna to return to the battlefield in the same way that I was ever there before. And every day that I did physical therapy, uh, it was a mission, but I was realizing that my ability to go out there and carry an eight pound rifle and carry 10 magazines of 20 rounds a piece and grenades and carry uh, you know, 30 pounds of explosives and 30 pounds of body armor and move across rough terrain and jump over walls and, and climb over everything that we have to do and chase people down, that wasn't gonna happen again. And the biggest struggle wasn't physical for me, it was mental. It was trying to figure out what do I do next? I'd lost my purpose in life. What do I go out there and do? How do I, how do I go out there and say, this is what I wake up for every morning? You know, my father, he and I, we love each other a lot. And uh, he's still with me, you know, I'm uh, 38, my father's 88. When he came to my bedside, uh, he told me how much that he loved me and how proud he was of me and how glad he was that I was okay, that I was alive. 
Um, but he and I, we weren't always those father and sons that went around saying that we love each other. Just, you know, we do, but it just wasn't who he and I were as men that we'd go around saying that we love each other. So it meant a lot when he came there to my bedside and he was saying that to me. But right after that, it went back to tough love. And uh, he gave me an important lesson. He said, Brian, you can't let this keep you down. You got to find a way to pull yourself up, to get yourself out there, to get back to work. He said, you can't let your kids see you sitting on your butt, regardless of what happens to you in life, because your kids are looking at you and they'll think that it's an okay way for them to go out there and live their life. You got to show them that you overcome no matter what. And so that was one of the most important lessons that my father, probably the most important lesson that my father ever gave me at probably the most difficult time that he could ever go out there and say it to me as I'm laying in a hospital bed, but it mattered and I carry it with me every single day. And, uh, you know, after that, it was, you know, looking at my wife, Brianna, who's been there through thick and thin, through it all, through all the, the, the blood, sweat and tears of it. And I just made a commitment to her and I, I told her, I wasn't going to let the best thing that I did in life. I wasn't going to let the best example that I set for our kids or the best contribution that I make to this country be something that was in my past. I was a lifer in the military. Um, I had served 12 years. I thought that I was going to serve 20 or 30 years in the army. That ultimately wasn't in the cards after that injury. And the most difficult part was losing that purpose that I had as a member of the military and saying, how do I find that again? And I believed that I could find that purpose again in serving my country, serving my community in a different way. And the battlefield would be Washington, D.C. The battlefield would be as a member of Congress. The battlefield would be legislative and laws. And what can I do to go out there and help my fellow service member on the battlefield with rules of engagement? What can I go out there and do to, to help my community with the things that matter both locally and nationally and internationally? And that was kind of the idea that I had in my head. And when, you know, being a good military guy, uh, when I got that idea in my head, I came up with a plan of attack. For any veteran that's leaving military service, whether it's after they serve 20 to 30 years and they're retiring from the military, or whether it's they served one or two contracts and they're saying, you know, I'm just ready to move on from military service and see what, see what else is out there in the world. It's important that we wake up, we have a reason to roll out of bed, put a shave on our face, you know, press our clothes, get out there, get into the workforce and do something each and every day. We're driven in that very special way as members of the military. Um, you know, our drive is something that, that we wear on our sleeve. It's something that as when, when we're in uniform, there's never a moment that we'd go out there and say, I can't get over at that obstacle. I can't get to that wall. I can't make it up that mountain. I can't carry this. There's never a moment of I can't, I can't do it. It doesn't exist. There's always mission, and that's something that's ingrained into our heart. And after we take off that uniform for the last time, it is something I think probably the most important thing that we carry with ourselves and go out there and share with the civilian population that this is what the human body, the human psyche, the human being is capable of doing. We all face challenges. They're physical and they're mental and they're emotional and they're financial and they're educational and they're marital and there's a thousand different challenges or explosions that we can all face in our life, but we don't quit after them. For most of us, if we look at the, the time that we were challenged, we probably look back on it as the most important time and the most memorable time in our life when we overcame those challenges. And if we, if we take that part out of life, then we're missing an important part of it. And so uh, when I think about you know, the mission after the military, putting something in front of ourselves that tries us, that challenges us, it's one of the best parts of life. And if we cease to challenge ourselves, then we're missing out on a big part of it.